and there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission, one message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, the news program that reports the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help us God. I'm Rick Wiles. Welcome to one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. Are Russia and China openly warning the United States of America that they are preparing to launch a first strike nuclear attack on this country? I'll ask my guest that question later in the program, Dr. Mark Schneider, senior analyst at the National Institute for Public Policy in Washington, will join me in 10 minutes to discuss Russian and Chinese nuclear warfare capabilities and threats. Let's look at the news headlines first. President Obama's strong support of the Muslim Brotherhood and his handling of the Syrian crisis have resulted in the loss of Egypt as an American ally in the Middle East. The Brotherhood briefly ruled Egypt following last year's revolution, but the army ousted the Brotherhood last summer. The Obama administration firmly sided with the Muslim Brotherhood, thereby angering the Egyptian army. Egypt has now opened its arms to Russia. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov is in Cairo today for several days of meetings with top Egyptian officials. Sources said the two main topics of discussion will be a deal to sell billions of dollars worth of Russian military hardware and weapons to Egypt, and an agreement to allow the Russian Navy to build a naval base at an Egyptian port, most likely the city of Alexandria. Prior to Mr. Lavrov's arrival in Cairo, the flagship of Russia's Pacific Fleet docked at a Mediterranean port, and that was uh, the city of Alexandria, and the uh, Russian warship was greeted with a gun salute. Now, Depka.com reported that that Russia will provide Egypt with stealth aircraft, drones, and cruise missiles to defend Egyptian airspace, the Suez Canal, the Red Sea, and its coastal waters. Depka said that the package may include defenses in eastern Egypt to defend some Saudi Arabian cities, too. Depka.com also reported that Russia will supply Egypt with advanced missiles capable of reaching all the key points in the Middle East, including Iran. Depka said 1,500 Russian troops will be deployed in Egypt soon to have the missiles operational by mid-2014. And not only have... Not only have we lost Egypt as an American ally, but we, we've also alienated Israel much uh, farther in the past uh, several months. Uh, there's a war of words between the U.S. and Israel uh, with the, over the Obama administration's push to sign a deal with Iran regarding the Islamic Republic's quest for nuclear power. Israeli news sources reported last week that Prime Minister Netanyahu was so angry with Secretary of State John Kerry that he refused to shake his hand when the two leaders met to discuss the proposed Western deal with Iran. Uh, Also, a fuming Mr. Netanyahu kept Mr. Kerry waiting for a scheduled meeting. Uh, The next day, the Israeli leader publicly denounced the deal. And uh, Mr. Kerry responded by saying that the Obama administration isn't stupid. The uh, talks collapsed over the weekend after a surprise alliance between Saudi Arabia, the uh, Arab Emirates, Israel, and France came together and blocked acceptance of the deal in Geneva. Now, 
Mr. Net, you, Mr. Netanyahu has uh, dispatched a key Jewish ally in his cabinet uh, to Washington to build opposition in the U.S. against Mr. Obama's overtures to Iran. Israeli Cabinet Minister Naftali Bennett is seeking to recruit members of the U.S. Congress to block President Obama from signing an agreement with Iran and to force him to keep economic sanctions on Iran. Uh, the new pope appears to be moving quickly to develop ecumenical ties with other worldwide branches of Christianity. Russian news agencies reported today that the head of the Russian Orthodox Church and a powerful Roman Catholic cardinal said on Tuesday that both groups are working together in preparation for Vladimir Putin's historic visit to the Vatican on November 25th to meet with Pope Francis. Russian Patriarch Kirill met with Archbishop of Milan, Angelo Scola. Uh, The Russian Patriarch said that preserving the origins of Christian civilization is the common goal between the two branches of Christianity. Homosexual marriage is now legal in the state of Hawaii. Governor Neil Abercrombie signed a bill today that legalized same-sex marriage in the state. Hawaiian officials hope the law will spur tourism as gay couples rush to the Pacific Islands to get married. A University of Hawaii researcher predicted that it would tap into a pent-up demand across America for memorable same-sex wedding events and that it would boost tourism in Hawaii by $200 million over the next three years as gay couples hold wedding ceremonies, receptions, parties, and honeymoons on the Pacific island of Hawaii. President Obama issued a statement today congratulating Hawaii for legalizing same-sex marriage. He said giving homosexuals and lesbians the right to marry exemplifies the values that Americans hold dear as a nation. Mr. Obama said it made him very proud of his home state. As Hawaii's government embraces same-sex marriage today, a delegation of Chinese PLA troops are participating today in Hawaii in a disaster relief exercise. Chinese Communist People's Liberation Army soldiers will participate alongside U.S. Army soldiers and Hawaii National Guard troops uh, on Wednesday and Thursday to simulate relief operations after a disaster strikes an unnamed country. Now, this is the first time in American history that uniformed Chinese communist soldiers have been on American soil. Now, let's take a short break. When I return, I will talk with Dr. Mark Schneider about Russian and Chinese nuclear war preparedness plans. I'm Rick Wiles. You're listening to True News. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. You're listening to True News, the end time newscast. This is Max McLean. Why should we give praises to the Lord? Listen to the Bible from Psalm 138. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. When I called, you answered me. You made me bold and stout-hearted. May all the kings of the earth praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth, when they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is on high, he looks upon the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. With your right hand, you save me. From Psalm 138. Listen to the Bible. It's great for the soul. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing. Be able to hear the Word of God today and every day. To hear more, go to radiobible.org. You're listening to True News, your alternative source for global news, analysis, and commentary. I'm Rick Wiles. Last week, NATO held a major war preparedness exercise in Eastern Europe near the Russian border. Over 6,000 NATO troops participated in steadfast jazz. Military exercises were held in Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, and other regions. The exercise scenario 
was a NATO response to an attack on Poland. The NATO exercise in Poland was preceded in September by the joint Russian-Belarus exercise known as Zapad. Some Eastern European officials and news outlets speculated that the purpose of that drill was to prepare for a nuclear strike on Poland because of its ties to NATO. Russian leaders viewed last week's NATO exercise as an encroachment on their border. Last year, a senior Russian army commander implied that Russia was prepared to use tactical nukes against NATO bases in Eastern Europe if the military alliance continues to move closer to the Russian border. Prior to the NATO exercise in early November, Russian President Vladimir Putin took two actions that demand attention from those of us in the West. First, he rescinded a 2011 presidential order that set up a Kremlin group to establish cooperation with NATO. Second, Mr. Putin personally participated as commander-in-chief over a surprise military drill in which Russian strategic nuclear forces launched two land-based ICBMs and two submarine-launched ballistic missiles that were closely monitored by U.S. intelligence agencies. Dr. Mark Snyder told the Washington Free Bacon that the snap drill of the Russian strategic nuclear forces was a major strategic nuclear exercise involving nuclear war. Dr. Snyder is a senior analyst at the National Institute for Public Policy. He's on the phone right now from Washington. Dr. Snyder, welcome to True News. Thank you. Thank you for, very much for having me on. Yes, sir. Well, let's start the discussion uh, with the NATO exercise. The Russians believe that NATO is building a ring around their country of military bases and missile defense systems that could easily be converted to offensive missile launching systems. Do the Russians have legitimate reasons to be nervous? Well, absolutely not. Uh, There's nothing um, um, that um, is going to be deployed in in Europe uh, for missile defense purposes um, that could uh, have any capability uh, to attack a, a surface target. Um, what I think the Russians are doing here, and, 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 this, and this claim um, goes back um, to 2007, um, and uh, it, it really hasn't changed much uh, since then, despite the fact that the entire architecture in, of the proposed European system has been scaled back, and, and uh, uh, the type of missile, it, it has no relationship to what was being considered or uh, proposed in, in uh, 2007. Uh, but they have made this this claim, and I think it's it's typical of what they do. Um, they they tend to, uh, in effect, mirror image on the United States things um, that they are actually doing. Now, uh, Pavel um, Felgengauer, who is a very distinguished Russian journalist, uh, reported on on a couple of occasions um, that. Uh, the um, all of the major Russian uh, missile defense interceptors uh, and um, um, bomber defense missiles, what we call surface-to-air missiles, are actually nuclear-armed, uh, and they have a secondary ground strike role. And um, he reported that this was actually exercised in 2010 uh, during uh, the Vos, uh, Vostok a 2010 exercise in the Far East. Uh, he, he reported that a, a, a nuclear uh, surface-to-air missile was fired against the ground target. So I, I think that um, uh, that explains how, you know, uh, uh, the rather silly Russian uh, claim here. Mm-hmm. Because we essentially have no tactical nuclear weapons in the, left in our arsenal other than the, the B-61 bomb. Uh, we um, we literally have nothing to put on. If we wanted to um, put a nuclear warhead um, on uh, the SM3 interceptor that will, under the uh, uh, Obama plan will be deployed in Eastern Europe, uh, you, you'd have to go out and develop uh, a brand-new warhead because there's nothing in the U.S. inventory that uh, um, that uh, uh, that's associated with the... Um, 
either operational or, or associated in any way with the, the SM-3. So it's a, it's a rather silly um, Russian um, charge, to put it mildly. What, what if the Russians were putting a missile defense system in Mexico, Canada, and the Caribbean islands? Would we be concerned? Um uh, Probably not. Uh, I mean, I mean the, the, the only, the, it probably would not be um, um, acknowledged by um, the, the Obama administration if it were, what was actually happening. Um, there's, no, um, uh, there's no way that you can intercept ICBMs uh, with this type of uh, system. Uh, one of the most amazing things was in the um, Moscow Missile Defense um, Conference. I believe it was 2012. It was a big uh, undertaking in, in uh, Moscow, and, and they, they laid out their whole case. Uh, and they exaggerated the performance of, of U.S. systems and came to the conclusion uh, that they could almost intercept Russian ICBMs. Well, they, they had only one single trajectory uh, plotted, um, and there are probably maybe 20 basic trajectories between the United States and, and, and Russia. And uh, that's the best that they could argue. Now, um, the Russians have nothing that they could deploy anywhere um, in um, uh, in Mexico or Cuba or anywhere else that could be um, a um, threat to uh, to U.S. ICBM forces. Now, if uh, Pavel Felgenauer is right about uh, nuclear armed SAMs with a surface to surface role, then that's a little bit of a, of, a, of a different story than you would be uh, concerned about something like this if, if, it, if it happened, but not for any, any missile defense capability. Okay. What, what about Poland? Some Polish newspapers speculated that the Russian-Belarus war exercise, uh, that the scenario was a first strike on Poland. Uh, does Poland have any legitimate reason to be nervous? Well, yes. I mean, the, the, since um, the rise of Vladimir Putin in um, 1999, uh, he rapidly moved from um, the, the secretary of, of the Russian National Security Council, which is equivalent to our national security advisor, to prime minister and then to acting president, and, and a little after that, president of Russia. He was involved, directly involved, uh, in um, the... Um, a new Russian uh, military doctrine, which was uh, made public in, in um, 1999, and uh, it was signed into law by acting President Putin in the year 2000. And, and that uh, uh, basically uh, adopted a very low threshold for the introduction of nuclear weapons um, into um, warfare. Um, we 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 know that uh, the, starting in in, 90, in 1999 in a series of exercises, basically an annual exercise they call the Zapad um, exercise. I mean, Zapad means West. Um, that they uh, have introduced um, simulated uh, nuclear uh, weapon, uh, weapons detonations. Um, this was actually announced by the Russian Defense Minister for the 1999 exercise, uh, and has been repeatedly reported in the Russian press uh, for these exercises uh, from from that day on to um, to the present. Um, uh, under Mr. Putin, how low is the threshold now f- to use nuclear weapons? It's very low. I mean, um, in 2009, um, Mr. Petrushev, who um, is the current um, secretary of their National Security Council, uh, announced uh, that they had plans for, for nuclear weapons use in what he called regional and even local wars. Now, that's dangerous. He's talking about conventional wars now. That's dangerous because there's so many of these, and uh, they're not all that unusual. And then 2010, uh, Russian... Uh, the Russians published a revised version of, of their military doctrine, which actually said, um, define regional war as a war in which both nuclear and conventional weapons are used. So at, at a minimum, uh, they're talking about um, introducing nuclear weapons, first use of nuclear weapons in um, a um, regional war. And uh, I think it goes a lot lower than that, and, and I think that was confirmed 
uh, but by Petrushev in 2009 when he, he announced that they had plans uh, for, for, for use in local wars. And uh, the reference to local wars and nuclear weapons and use of, uh, at least in the, in the deterrence context, goes all the way back um, to uh, the uh, uh, general who was commanding the, the Russian um, uh, strategic missile forces in 1999. Uh, so th- uh, this is nothing really new. I mean, this is, this is what Putin has stood for um, since he has um, um, come to power. Uh, okay, now, okay, two weeks ago at the time that the NATO exercise was starting in Poland, Mr. Putin did two things. Uh, he sent two Tu-160 Blackjack strategic bombers to South America and, and Central America, and then he personally uh, participated as commander-in-chief in, in the SNAP drill, the latest SNAP drill, in which they launched four missiles. Um, should we view those two events as uh, a serious warning to the West to back off? Well, I, I don't think it's 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 um, a warning to 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 back off. It's uh, part of a, uh, uh, a a broader nuclear strategy uh, that entails the use of overt nuclear threats to um, to achieve political uh, gains and, and benefits. And this again, this was initiated by Vladimir Putin. Um, in um, February uh, of uh, uh, 2007, he, he delivered the, his annual State of the Nation message uh, in, the, in the Duma, and it was a rapidly anti-American uh, speech. I refer to us as, quote, Comrade Wolf, and that has a lot of symbolic significance in, in Russia. And um, within a few days of that, the... Um, the um, head of the Strategic Missile Forces talked about targeting um, nuclear missiles uh, against um, NATO uh, countries uh, that were involved in a missile defense program. And, and those threats have, have not ceased uh, um, since uh, that date. Putin himself uh, said that several times, uh, in, including uh, two meetings uh, in which he was face-to-face with the presidents of other countries. He talked about targeting his nuclear missiles against them. He's doing this because he believes he gets political clout for that. You know, he's, this is not the first time he has uh, orchestrated a, 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 a major uh, nuclear strike exercise, in this case, in light of the weapons involved. It was obviously against the United States mm-hmm. and, and NATO. But what, what, um, what's the possibility that he's dead serious? That this isn't about a strategic chess game to gain political advantage. What if he's dead serious about it? Well, he is um, dead serious um, in the sense um, that he wants to um, move back uh, toward the you know reemergence of the of the Soviet Union to the extent he can. He he knows he he's weak. Uh, he he knows. Um, that uh, there are limitations of his power, and he, he, he believes that using these types of threats um, are, one, uh, are one way to, um, to uh, enhance his, his power position. What really concerns me um, is that for now approximately 15 years, um, the Russian military leadership uh, has heard their most senior officials talk um, about um, first use of nuclear weapons in conflicts uh, that are, in, in some in some in some sense, uh, fine, uh, really uh, fairly minor things, um, and that has to affect the way their military leadership thinks about nuclear weapons use. Has to affect their military planning, and it's going to impact um, the next generation of, of Russian. Um, um, Military leaders, the, the the guys who are now, um, you know, colonels and majors, and, and you know, ten years from now will be generals, or at least some of them will be. Uh, I mean, that's all they've heard um, for the last uh, fifteen years. That's and why I'm concerned. That's about, why I'm uh, concerned they're going to be used. Yes, so am I. Um, particularly um, if we uh, go to some type of minimum deterrence posture. Uh, and uh, that is a uh, very dangerous uh, 
thing. What, what, um, what was the significance of Mr. Putin's active participation and oversight of this latest uh, nuclear launch drill? He does this often. Um, yeah, well, what, he, what's he the significance? It. The significance uh, is he's sending a message uh, on how serious he thinks um, uh, this is uh, and his willingness uh, to you know, literally fight World War III. If you take a look at, at what the Kremlin said about this exercise and what the, the Russian Defense Ministry um, said about um, this exercise, uh, they launched the four strategic um, um, missiles, nuclear missiles that you uh, mentioned. They, they launched four uh, tactical uh, nuclear missiles. Uh, they, lost, they launched three um, strategic cruise missiles. And, and uh, then the, the bomber flight uh, to uh, Venezuela, which may have been part of the exercise. At least that's been suggested in, in, in the press. Uh, I mean, and on top of that, he exercised the um, the uh, missile defense and, and bomber defense forces in his uh, in his country. There were uh, a, a live ABM uh, launch and, and 12 uh, surface-to-air missile launches. Uh, so this was basically his version of World War III. You know, and and that uh, that's war fighting. The the, the uh, four missile the four missiles that were launched uh, were a uh, there was a silo based SS eighteen, a road mobile SS twenty five, an SS N eighteen, and an SS N twenty three. Both of those launched by submarines. How lethal are those missiles in their ability to deliver warheads? Uh, well, they're incredibly lethal. I mean the uh, the um, SS-18 uh, is the most powerful um, um, missile in the world. I mean, uh, according to uh, uh, Russian press reports, um, it has carries a 10 um, thermonuclear warheads of 775 kilotons. Uh, that uh, is quite a uh, a big weapon. Uh, the uh, the other missiles, uh, the 25 is a single warhead missile. Uh, there are many reports it's got 550 kilo. Other t- uh, the other two are heavily MERV uh, SLBMs. So basically, he he this wasn't um, an exercise in in um, escalation in the sense of um, um, you know uh, doing a demonstration strike. He, uh, I mean, uh, what was done was sort of a microcosm, a small version of their general uh, you know war plan against us. So, so it was a, it was clear. a miniature version of of World War Three. Yes, I mean uh, uh, th- that's the only way to to think of this. I, I mean, um, the fact that there are live launches that this is not a a pure deterrence exercise where you simulate a crisis and and um, um, you know generate your forces. I mean that's why you tend, at least we do, tend to to stage exercises to 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 give the uh, you know commands uh, experience in, in what you would have to do in a, in a really serious crisis. But this involved uh, simulated execution of, of uh, both theater nuclear strikes and, and strategic nuclear strikes um, with their main weapon systems. Uh, and that's serious business, in my view. As a preemptive first strike? Yes. Well, I mean, I, I assume that. Well, I mean, uh, you're saying that this scenario typically, you know, it, you know, involves a, uh, a response to some crisis. Uh, in, in this case, it sounds like they were just uh, doing a drill on, on launching a, a full-scale attack. Well, I, I think uh, I, I think the the variety of nuclear delivery vehicles used and the numbers of, of actual launches uh, suggest that they were simulating a, a, a pretty much an all-out nuclear attack. What, what kind uh, of defenses? Than, what kind of defenses does the U.S. need to be prepared for such a Russian attack? Well, obviously, the first thing you need um, is a is a, a credible nuclear deterrent. Um, that is sufficiently capable um, to um, strike back against the uh, types of targets the um, the Russians value uh, most, uh, and there's an enormous uh, disparity right now in the modernization programs. Russia has announced it's going to modernize their entire strategic missile force by 2021. They say it'll have 98 percent of it replaced presumably the uh, 
the other 2% uh, uh, represents the residual SS-18 heavy ICBMs, but that's just a guess. Um, we are not going to introduce anything um, before the very late 2020s, and even then, uh, the, the, uh, and, uh, under best-case assumptions that these programs actually continue, that they're actually funded, that the, uh, th- that the, the, the words that the administration has said turn into actual programs. Um, we will have only a partial modernization, um, and um, the, the, we, we operate under numerous constraints on what sort of modernization um, that we can do. Uh, we're precru- precluded from developing any new nuclear weapon. We're pre- precluded from improving um, the performance of our nuclear weapons in any significant way. Uh, that's almost across the board. Um, and we're replacing our, uh, you know, basically Reagan to to Eisenhower. I mean, we literally have 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 bombers today that were were built. Uh, or, or at least funded and, 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 and uh, you know, built between um, the late Eisenhower and early Kennedy administration. We're talking about replacing these things um, when they're between 40 and 80 years of age. Now, just think about what sort of aircraft, aircraft um, were flying around 80 years ago. And, you know, to, su- to suggest that uh, you can have a credible deterrent with, with antique weapon systems is, is pretty wild. And that's and and I'm really making best case assumptions here that these programs actually continue that they're not killed off by sequestration and, and future budget cuts, which is what I fear more more than anything else right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Snyder, in, in August the world came very close to a war in the Middle East. The U.S. and Israel uh, launched two Sparrow missiles over the Mediterranean Sea near Syria on September second. The Russian general staff thought Israel had launched a preemptive strike on Syria, and some Russian officials feared it would lead to World War III. It was serious enough that they notified Mr. Putin that the war may have started, and it was reported in Russia that the uh, Russian military forces went on war alert. Now, eventually, Mr. Obama backed down from the threat to attack Syria, but in your estimation, how close did we be, how close did we come that day to an all-out Middle Eastern war? Well, I don't think uh, I don't think there was any um, real threat of a you know uh, a, a major war in, in the Middle East uh, in that particular scenario. What uh, disturbs me is uh, this: this is the week that the G20 summit. Uh, with either the heads of state or heads of government of, of the 20 most uh, important nations in the world meeting in St. Petersburg, mm-hmm. uh, Russia. And the Russian um, defense ministry, the Russian defense ministry, announces a, a strategic nuclear exercise uh, on the days of the meeting. Um, and they announced uh, that their mobile ICBMs were going out and taking up, quote, field firing positions. Now, that's mind-boggling. Uh, that uh, that announcement was made. Wh- that, that they made that announcement while the G20 was in session. Yes, that's brazen, isn't it? It is. I mean, it's it 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 reflects a completely different view of nuclear weapons uh, than exists anywhere in the West today. I mean, it, it's it's. Uh, I I found that absolutely mind-boggling uh, that you could do something like that during a uh, meeting, uh, international meeting, in your own country. But how, to me, I'm interpreting this as a direct threat by Mr. Putin to the West, saying, if you attack Syria, we're willing to go all the way. It's possible, that's a possibility, that there was a Syria linkage in in, um, this exercise. As a matter of fact, um, a Russian... um, publication uh, closely linked to the Kremlin, um, had an article on the Russian Navy uh, in, in the uh, Mediterranean. And, and what it said was that the, um, the, the, the Russian Navy was there to deter uh, the United States uh, by uh, threat of, of war, uh, and uh, 
that the while the United States had retired its all its tactical nuclear weapons, the Russian Navy hadn't and was well equipped with tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, and I mean, this is the mentality that drives things uh, in Russia today. Okay, now after that event in, with the G20 in Syria and all those things that happened. The U.S. quietly withdrew its naval forces out of the Mediterranean. Britain pulled out. France pulled out. The, the whole Western alliance pulled out. And Russia rushed in with uh, a dozen or more warships. And to my knowledge, uh, as of right now, the Russians are, are in control of the Mediterranean. Um, once well, again, they certainly have a very large military um, presence for by the you know post war. Yes, war II. and now they're moving in. Uh, now they're moving into standard. Egypt. Uh, Mr. Lavrov is in Cairo today. Uh, he's after a a naval base in Alexandria. Uh, the Russians are going to be selling billions of dollars worth of weapons to Egypt. Uh, we've lost Egypt as an ally. T- to me, uh, Doctor Snyder, something profound happened. Uh, last month or so, or several months ago, uh, regarding Syria, to me, it looks like the entire balance of power in the Middle East shifted away from the United States and has moved towards Russia. Well, look, my, my view is that the um, Obama administration Middle Middle East policy is just a disaster, uh, an emerging, continuing uh, disaster that our s- support of the Arab Spring, the so-called Arab Spring, uh, was very ill-considered um, and has resulted in uh, developments, changes in the Middle East that are very inimical to to our interests and mm-hmm. uh, undo a lot of of, of the, um, well, if not all, of, of the um, the impact of, of the Bush administration in, in fighting terrorism. I mean, what's happened in Libya, uh, what's happened in Egypt, uh, and today what's happening uh, in Syria. Um, is um, you know a gross example of that. I mean, there's no good options in the Middle East. There never have been, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, there likely never will be. But um, we've made it so much worse uh, by ill-considered. Uh, and I, I'm not a Middle East expert. I don't pretend to be. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, it doesn't take much expertise to take a look at our Middle East policy and say it's a failure. Absolutely. Let's uh, let's turn our attention to China. Uh, Georgetown University professor Philip Carber was on this program uh, two years ago, and his research team uncovered the existence of a massive network of tunnels in China dug by the PLA. And he suspects that China's nuclear arsenal is hidden underground and is far bigger than what the West acknowledges. Uh, what do you think? Uh, I think he, he he's on to something. Um, U.S. official estimate is a few hundred Chinese nuclear weapons. Taiwanese Defense Ministry estimates about twice that number. Um, Phil, uh, and I've, uh, fr- Phil has been a friend of mine for decades, uh, estimates um, probably uh, up to 3,000. Uh, and um, a lot of, of Russian analysts, including some, some very well-known ones, um, and they're moderates. They're not uh, bomb thrower types. Um, they estimate anywhere from a thousand to thirty five hundred weapons uh, now irrespective of where the current number is there's no question um, that the number is going to grow I mean even the Obama administration uh, admits that the only real question is how rapidly it's going to grow and I, I think it's going to grow very rapidly uh, the Chinese have announced this tunnel system is 5,000 kilometers long. That is not consistent in any way, shape, or form with anything you could possibly need um, to, for a small force of, of mobile ICBMs. You'd have to, I mean, you'd have to be planning a literally massive force uh, to, to justify anything remotely like that. Um, so I, I think that's a, a very serious uh, threat. Um, and uh, one uh, that we're ill-prepared to deal with. Now, at the same time of the NATO drill and the Russian uh, snap drill, Chinese newspapers and television published detailed reports about the, quote, awesomeness, uh, unquote, of the PLA strategic uh, submarine force. And the news reports 
named the U.S. West Coast and East Coast cities that would be nuked in a war with America. How concerned should we be that the Chinese media is openly talking about nuclear war? Well, we should be uh, we should be very concerned uh, for for a, a, a lot of reasons. Uh, this was not the Chinese media; these were major state-controlled um, uh, media, and they ran exactly the same story. And as you as you mentioned, uh, it involved the, the cities were going to attack aim points in, in in Los Angeles, and a fallout map, uh, supposedly uh, illustrating uh, the. Um, um, the effect of the uh, the attack on the United States, and, and uh, uh, the story also contained the statement um, that a um, single uh, Type 94 submarine could inflict between 5 and, I think, 12 million uh, casualties on the United States. Uh, stuff like that doesn't happen um, by accident. Uh, it was clearly sending a, a, a message, uh, and you've got to see this... Um, in the context of the Chinese defense strategy a document, the so-called white paper they, they publish uh, every couple years usually uh, on national uh, defense, it dropped um, their no first use commitment. Now, I don't think their no first use commitment was ever real, but certainly um, the fact that it was dropped out of their major defense publication uh, is, again, sending a message. Okay, well, this is what worries me. We've got the Russians openly discussing nuclear war, and we got the Chinese discussing nuclear war and actually showing us the maps of the cities that they're going to take out and estimating the death toll. And we're sitting over here in the United States, um, m- most of the public oblivious that this is taking place. And and for the few people who do know about it, we're, we're trying to write it off as – it's just the Russians and the Chinese positioning for more power or clout. Yes, exactly. I, I mean, the, the mainstream media in the United States uh, just spiked the story. Um, you have to, I mean, um, Bill Gertz uh, did a good article in the Washington Free Beacon, um, and um, uh, the, uh, the London uh, Globe uh, ma- uh, newspaper uh, published a, a uh, uh, a good article which had a lot of direct quotes uh, mm-hmm. out of the Chinese uh, uh, publications. So I mean, uh, and it's all it's all over the the, the blogosphere right mm-hmm. now. I mean, uh, the the uh, the the, uh, uh, the the maps and 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 that sort of thing. You can find uh, numerous numerous sources, but they are not sources where you um, um, get high readership. Do you think the Chinese are telling us they want their their trillion dollars? No. Uh, that has nothing to do with with, with that. Uh, they they're making threats um, which are intended to um, um, force the United States uh, out of out of out of the Pacific. Really, you know, back to um, you know Hawaii, um, and um, oh. this is a part of it. The, the threat of uh, you oh. know nuclear war. Okay, speaking and, of, speaking of, of Hawaii, Grid X two started today. Uh, to test the preparedness of U.S. utilities to recover from a major cyber attack. But simultaneously, today and tomorrow, there are hundreds of Chinese PIA troops in Hawaii participating in a drill on responding to some type of national disaster. Why do we have Chinese troops in Hawaii today? Because uh, I think the uh, ill-advised belief um, that uh, you can... um talk the Chinese out of hostility to the United States and, and that the military-to-military contact, you know, contacts are going to uh, basically change their view about the United States. I don't think it has any chance mm-hmm. of work. But uh, it, it, it's consistent with, you know, the prevailing um, liberal uh, worldview. Mm-hmm. John McAfee was here yesterday. He said World War III will start as a cyber war. Is he correct? Well, um I don't know. I mean, you're more likely to 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 see a major cyber attack in in less than World War Three uh, uh, situation. Uh, I, I suspect that there will be uh, if if World War Three were to break out. Um, you know, the cyber attacks would would be a precursor to it. Mm-hmm. But um, um, cyber attacks basically. Um, 
are designed to be disruptive and um, get you more time to deliver the actual attack. Cyber is not going to destroy uh, mm-hmm. an ICBM silo right. or a bomb base or anything like that. No, they're going to so, uh, they uh, turn out the lights and then um, the country's yeah. in a state of panic, and then they deliver uh, the yeah. the full attack. Uh, yes, I mean. Um, you know, there there is some uncertainty on the effectiveness of cyber attack. Uh, uh, you know, there are predictability issues. Uh, ultimately, you don't know what's, uh, what antivirus software is going to be in the other guy's computer mm-hmm. uh, the day you launch the attack. Uh, having said that, it's I'm sure it's going to be tried, and, mm-hmm. and, and, and it will be used in conflicts much less than in World War III. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Snyder, I've, I've talked on this radio program since 1999 about the threat of an EMP attack. In, in 2013, are we better prepared or still vulnerable? I think we, we might be slightly better prepared, but we certainly are are still, um, you know, very vulnerable to that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Wh- some actions have been taken, but not nearly enough. Wh- which nation poses the greater threat of launching an EMP attack on America? Russia, China, North Korea, Iran? I think um, every one of them uh, you listed um, um, have at least plans for for that type uh, of attack. They they uh, uh, vary very considerably uh, in terms of their ability to implement that mm-hmm. type of attack. But uh, I think it's it's a, a basic attack option. Look, we we have created a giant EMP antenna in the United States thanks to our environmental friends. Uh, they have prevented the construction of um, power plants, and the way around that was to network the um, the electrical grid uh, in a manner, and this is an unintended side effect, that you're just building a gigantic EMP an- antenna to intensify the effect of any um, EMP attack. You take down the power systems in the United States, everything collapses. So they, they've linked the grids... And, and and so that has now made us even more vulnerable. Yes. I mean, it's, it's been going on for a period of, of decades uh, mm-hmm. that this is the only way to adjust um, to uh, the requirements to provide um, electricity mm-hmm. to um, uh, to our people do, do you uh, while they're out building new plants. Do, do you remember several years ago there was uh, the, the – uh, local CBS television affiliate in California, uh, uh, there in L.A., in a helicopter, and they, they witnessed what they described as a sea-based uh, ICBM launch, and they, they videoed it. And for several days, uh, you know, there were there was discussion that this, this was an ICBM. I, I had uh, uh, retired General West, who was uh, the former deputy a commander of NORAD was on the program. He said, "By all means, it was a, it was an ICBM." Uh, d- d- do you think that that perhaps was uh, a a Chinese test of a possible EMP attack on the USA? No, I don't. Um, I've I've seen the 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 the, the, the photographs of, of of this particular incident. I don't know what it what it was. Mm-hmm. Um, General West said it was an ICBM. He said, without a doubt, it was an ICBM. He said, I don't know where it came from. Operational one. I mean, Mm -hmm. submarine launch ballistic missile. They didn't have an operational system with with that sort of range uh, in that time period. They they just gone operational uh, Mm -hmm. with the uh, JL two. The uh, it's an ICBM range SLBM, Mm -hmm. Uh, but they didn't have it back then. Okay, perhaps it was Russian. Um, Um, you know, I. I mean, somebody got if real close to our shore attack, and launched it. That's what that's what concerns me. Somebody was really close to that, us. If, if you're going to launch that sort of attack, I think you do it from a greater distance mm-hmm. uh, for the survivability of the submarines. I, I doubt that that I, – I don't know what exactly happened, but I doubt that that was an actual mm-hmm. uh, ICBM launch near. All near right. Coast. I got uh, two more questions before I let you go. Uh, Mr. Obama has ordered the Joint Chiefs of Staff to reduce our nuclear arsenal to approximately 1,000 warheads. There are reports he'd like to take it down to 300. I think if he had his uh, dream come true, it would be zero. Uh, has this uh, disarming process actually begun? Uh, as far as we, we, we know, yes. What he announced was um, that 
uh, he uh, wanted to uh, reduce um, the U.S. deployed strategic nuclear uh, weapons for a spy up to, to one-third. Um, it was ambiguous. Um, he, he indicated his preference was to, to do this um, as part of an arms control agreement. Um, the Russians actually rejected the, his Berlin speech proposal on the day um, it was delivered. Uh, Putin himself delivered, in effect, the reply saying, we're not interested. Uh, and you had the, uh, the guy by the name of Rogozin, who's the uh, deputy prime minister who handles the defense um, um, portfolio, uh, to make, he made an absolutely insulting statement about Obama being incompetent and lying and so on and on and on and on. I mean, um, so they, you got a, a resounding no uh, from, uh, from the Russians. Um, from, it's a bad idea. Um, if you take a look at what impact uh, a thousand weapons would have on the U.S. deterrent, it would be very negative. It would cut force uh, structure very uh, seriously, and I don't believe we will have um, adequate um, targeting capability with a thousand warheads. And I, I would suggest uh, that the um, the nuclear global zero report, which you know may have been a precursor to to that proposal, it actually targeted approximately a thousand nuclear weapons and came up with its own war plan. And the war plan didn't attack uh, most military targets, uh, did no defense suppression strikes, and and um, hit no communications targets. And the reason was they didn't have enough weapons to. To, to do it. Are so you I hearing? Are, are you hearing idea. whether? Have you heard whether there's any serious internal opposition inside the the Joint Chiefs of Staff or the highest levels of the military against this disarmament? There's a lot of caution um, um, there. Um, uh, they don't. Um, they are extremely cautious about. Um, cuts of that magnitude. Um, the the um, um, General Shilton, who was the commander of the uh, U.S. Strategic Command during the New START negotiation, uh, stated uh, uh, very overtly uh, that um, he um, could not support any cuts um, in um, uh, force levels under, under New START. And I, I think that there is some degree of resistance, but uh, quite frankly, there's a limit uh, to um, what any uh, any general can do to oppose the president. Okay, and you can't do it overtly. Okay, we have the Russians uh, preparing for a first strike, carrying out uh, snap drills, launching missiles. We have the Chinese publishing maps of the cities they're going to nuke, and we have the U.S. president uh, disarming the country. Doctor Snyder, this does not look good. No, it doesn't. I mean, uh, I, I think you need a, a substantial modernization program uh, that's real. I mean, it's not, not just paper, you know, uh, reports saying we're going to do this 20 years from now. Um, you've got to get systems under development. You've got you, you've to do things, I think, in some areas significantly faster uh, than the administration proposes, particularly a, a new uh, cruise missile for the, uh, the really now ancient the B-52 bombers, uh, you know, and, and um, I, I think we've we've got to um, um, restore the nuclear weapons, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure and complex. So we're, we're dealing with facilities, some of which literally go back to the World War II Manhattan Project, um, and that's that's a serious risk uh, when you know, you've got uh, both Russia and China with fully functional nuclear weapons complexes and. and uh, uh, they are both very clearly in multiple sources on on this um, developing new nuclear weapons. All right, and probably both testing these things uh, in what's called hydronuclear tests, which are very low yield nuclear experiments. All right, final question, and you probably haven't been asked this question for a couple of weeks: Is Russia's dead hand still active? Um, I think that. Um, well, I mean the. 
the discussion um, of, of that particular system, um, and it's, it's really an emergency launch system, uh, you know, according to the press reports, uh, has been very, uh, I, I mean, um, you know, uh, you know uh, very sort of yellow journalist type uh, things. Sure, I mean, sure, they've got all sorts of plans and capabilities uh, to assure that they could um, retaliate after uh, a, a nuclear strike upon them. I mean, we're not going to launch a nuclear strike upon them uh, in, in you know the context of a first strike. That's absurd. So I'm I don't worry too much about that sort of capability. What I worry uh, about um, is um, the Russians miscalculating, trying to use force to expand, uh, you know, and reconstitute the the Soviet Union, um, and um, then introducing um, nuclear weapons into the conflict, uh, that has, you know, very, very dangerous and unpredictable consequences, mm-hmm. and I don't think they take them seriously. All right. We'll let that be the final word. My guest, Dr. Mark Schneider, uh, he's a senior analyst at the National Institute for Public Policy. Dr. Schneider, appreciate you coming on True News. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ, this is True News. Do you want to know how to listen to God? You can begin right now. With Advice for Believers, here's today's moment with Charles Stanley. Here's what I'd like to suggest to you. Before you go to bed tonight, sometime today, this afternoon, whenever it's convenient to you, you get at the Word of God. You can either turn to your favorite passage or one you've never turned to before or the first psalm. And here's what you do. You say, Lord... I want to learn to listen to you. I choose to listen purposefully for you to speak to my heart in this passage or some other passage. But Lord, I'm committing myself today to learn how to listen to you because I want to be what you want me to be and I want to be able to accomplish what you want me to accomplish. Lord, this is my heart's desire and I'm going to trust you to teach me in Jesus' name. Will he answer that prayer? Guaranteed. Yes, he will. And the only way to become who God wants you to be is to first trust his son to forgive your debt of sin. Learn about salvation through faith in Christ when you visit us at intouch.org. Hey, as we close, I just want to share with the True News family just something personal from my heart. Uh, Most of you know that our daughter, Carissa, and her husband, our son-in-law, Marsha Washburn, and our three grandchildren, uh, Kiara, uh, Blake, and Grant, moved to to Ecuador in July of 2012. Uh, Carissa and Marsha started an orphanage and and children's home for abandoned and and unwanted children in Ecuador. And uh, so it's been – it's been a very difficult time for Susan and me to be separated from our family. Well, three weeks ago, Carissa and our three grandchildren surprised us by walking in the door of our home. We had no idea that they were coming back to see us. I, I cannot tell you how joyful we were to see them standing in our home. Uh, Susan cried like a baby when they arrived. And uh, I cried like a baby when they left. They were with us for three weeks, and uh, they departed on Monday evening. I, I, I hesitated to say anything on Monday's program because I was still so emotionally um, just uh, hurting from watching them leave again. I didn't think I could even say anything on the radio without breaking up and crying. Uh, we just didn't want to let go of them again and and, uh, watch them depart depart again and go back to Ecuador. But we know that Carissa and Marshall are serving the Lord and they're on the front lines and they're saving children. We just miss them so much and uh, just enjoyed every minute we had with them uh, during the last three weeks. Well, listen, got to go. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow right here on True News.